The ability of a microorganism to cause an infection is much more complicated than simply the presence of virulence factors in that organism. Disease is an outcome of a host microbe interaction, and I think we need to think about it much more in terms of shades of gray than black or white, it's a pathogen or it's not a pathogen. Today we're going to be talking about why disease happens and what it is about some host microbe interactions that leads to that outcome. So we live in a microbial world. Even our own bodies are only really about half our own. There have been recent studies that have found that the number of resident bacteria within and on us is approximately equal to the number of our own cells. Even the genomes which define us are only partially our own. Um, recent studies have estimated that 5 to 8% of our own genetic material are actually endogenous retroviruses. Microbes play really important functions, and actually, we need them. It's not only the microbes in us and on us, but those living out in the ecosystem. Um, they perform critical functions. Um, they fix nitrogen. Without them, we would have decreased plant growth. They produce oxygen. And microbes also play a critical role in waste cycling. They're able to break down nutrients, and without them, we would have an accumulating biomass that we wouldn't be able to deal with. So as much as getting sick really sucks, <laughs> we need our microbes, and we need to learn to love them. Besides that, some microbes are delicious. They're an important component of many um, culturally significant foods that I think many of us are familiar with. So things like fermented cheeses, bread, alcohol, yogurt, um, all requires the presence of microorganisms to make these foods a reality. What is it that makes some microbes delicious and other microbes pathogenic? When we're discussing pathogenicity and the ability of an organism to cause disease, I think we really need to start with Cox postulates. This is our prototypical model for demonstrating um, disease causality. So Cox postulate states that uh, the microorganism must be found in every animal suffering from disease, but not any healthy animals. We must be able to grow that organism in pure culture from those diseased animals. That isolated organism must then be able to be introduced into a healthy animal to reproduce disease. And we must then be able to re-isolate that organism from the animal that was experimentally infected. The issue with Cox postulates is that, strictly speaking, very few organisms are actually pathogens. Um, most bacteria and most fungi are somewhere between obligate pathogens and non-pathogenic colonizers. So pathogenicity can be host-specific. For instance, E. coli 0157 is a potentially very serious human pathogen, um, causing gastroenteritis, systemic disease, it's associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome, but it's a commensal in the bovine gut. So is it a pathogen or isn't it a pathogen? Well, it, it really depends on the context. There are very few true strict pathogens. Rabies may be the best example. Um, it is never normal to find this in an animal. Um, and if it is there, it's uniformly associated with disease. Yersinia pestis, or the causative agent of plague in both people and domestic species, would be another example. It's never normal to find Yersinia pestis. But by and large, disease is context-specific, and pathogenicity is context-specific. In fact, even microorganisms can be infected with other microorganisms. So the image on the back of this slide is actually a brachyspira. Um, this is uh, an intestinal spirochete in pigs. And in this electron micrograph, what you can see are actually bacteriophages that are infecting, parasitizing, and ultimately killing this bacteria. So pathogenicity is something that goes much beyond uh, just the realm of visible animals. There's a few key definitions that we need to discuss. So first of all is pathogen. 
Um, this is an organism capable of causing disease. It doesn't necessarily mean that it does cause disease in all circumstances, but one capable of, of producing a, a de deleterious outcome on a host. Virulence is the relative ability of an organism to cause disease. Virulence factor is some property of an organism which allows it to both establish within a host and or cause disease. So some physiological property that um, allows it to be a pathogen. And then pathogenesis refers to the processes and host microbe interactions that actually lead to disease. So if we don't always see disease resulting from host microbe interactions, how, how can we look at these interactions? Um, I think we need to consider them as a spectrum from benefit through indifference to damage, with damage being obviously disease and pathology. So we might be able to characterize these interactions as either colonization, so these are sort of the normal microbiota, the healthy organisms that we all have living in and on us. Latency, maybe this is an indifferent interaction, the organism isn't providing any sort of benefit to the host, but also not causing any pathology. And then disease. So what determines where on this scale uh, a particular interaction will fall? So infections occur when you have either an overwhelming pathogen load or compromised host defenses. Disease then results from either the production of toxins or the invasion of tissues. Keeping these four factors in mind, I think we can explain most infectious processes that we encounter, and this serves as a really useful model to understand pathogenesis. So what are the steps of pathogenesis? Well, first, the microorganism has to associate. It has to make its way into the body and reach the site of infection. Now, that can either be the animal as a whole, it can be a specific anatomical location, a specific cell type, or a specific receptor. So it needs to make its way to the place where it completes its life history. Um, there's a variety of strategies that bacteria can use to do that. So in this image here, you can see a clostridial organism with flagellae. This is a structure that facilitates motility and allows the bacteria to move towards the site of infection. Other organisms produce fimbrae and attachment factors that allow them to latch on to specific host receptors. Once the organism has associated, it needs to multiply and evade host immune responses. So it needs to acquire nutrients um, and reach some sort of critical number uh, where it can really establish an active infection. Now, multiplication and nutrient acquisition can actually be quite difficult. Free iron, for instance, is at a very low concentration in the blood. And so proteins like siderophores are produced by microbes in order to scavenge any free iron that's uh, present. Other bacteria produce capsules to prevent deposition of complement and phagocytosis. And here you can see a mucoid pastorella multocida. This is very helpful in evading the innate immune system. Next, we see damage or co-opting of host physiological processes. So production of toxins or using host machinery for invasion. This is where we see pathology. This is where we see lesions, and this is where we see damage associated with disease. And finally, the organism needs to transmit. It needs to find a new host. So get in, cause an infection, get out, survive, infect, and repeat. And there's a variety of strategies that bacteria use in order to do this. So we need to have them shed efficiently into the environment. So here you can see a cytological preparation from a horse with Streptococcus equi. This is the causative agent of strangles. And we get large numbers of organisms shed in purulent material or pus from abscessed lymph nodes. Other organisms produce structures like spores that allow them to survive in the environment for potentially even decades. Now, I've described pathogenesis in a very stepwise manner, but I think it's important to know that this is really not a linear process. Um, for the sake of this model, I think it's convenient to describe it as sort of five steps, but these processes can be happening simultaneously or in a different order. So what are virulence factors? 
what are these properties of bacteria that enable them to cause disease? There's a few different ways to break this down. I think it's useful to consider essential virulence genes. So these would be factors which cause demonstrable damage to the host themselves, things like toxins. We have virulence-associated genes, which may be required for the expression, secretion, or processing of essential virulence genes. So they don't cause disease in and of themselves, but without them, the essential virulence genes aren't able to have their effect. And then we have virulence lifestyle genes, which allow the organism to survive in sort of the general environment where it causes disease. They allow it to colonize or otherwise reach the site of infection. The background for this slide is uh, encapsulated bacillus anthracis, so the cause of anthrax. What you can see if we zoom in is that we have these rod-shaped bacteria, so this is the bacillus anthracis, surrounded by this lucent area. This is a capsule, and that capsule protects the organism from phagocytosis and the innate immune system, sort of a virulence lifestyle gene. It allows it to survive within the host, and then it produces a number of proteins which it uses to cause disease, so lethal factor, edema factor, and protective antigen. Now, lethal factor and edema factor, once internalized into the host cells, are what's responsible for disease itself. These would be thought of as essential virulence genes. Protective antigen is actually kind of like a shuttle protein. It brings lethal factor and edema factor into the cell, allowing it to reach its uh, site of action. So it's more of a virulence-associated gene. In the next few slides, we're going to go through different categories of virulence factors, describe some examples, how they work, and what they allow the organisms to do. So as I mentioned previously, association is the first step required for pathogenesis, and structures used for attachment to host tissues are therefore critically important in the establishment of infections. Examples in staphylococci and streptococci include the MSCRAMs, these microbial surface components recognizing adhesive matrix molecules. You can see why it's abbreviated. Um, these are proteins that bind to host ligands. So they bind to fibrinogen, collagen, fibronectin, host proteins that they can grab onto um, and, and associate for infection. Not only do they allow them to attach, but they may also be antiphagocytic by presenting opsonization. Any of the virulence factors that we're discussing may have a primary function for the pathogen, or at least what we think of as the primary function, but likely it has a multiplicity of roles. Fimbrae are also very well studied, particularly in E. coli. The F4 fimbrae uh, allow them to bind to the intestinal epithelium in pigs in an age-dependent manner. Receptors for the F4 fimbrae are present in piglets up to eight weeks old. Similarly, the F5 fimbrae allows E. coli to bind to the epithelium in the distal small intestine of calves in just the first few days of life. So we have a tissue-specific, the distal small intestine, a cell-specific, the epithelium, and an age-specific factor that makes pathogenesis quite specific to a particular cohort of animals. Flagella, or other factors which enhance motility, are, are also very important. And I think it's relatively easy to understand how the bacteria being able to move facilitates disease. If we think about motile E. coli, for instance, they're able to swim up from the distal urinary tract up into the urinary bladder and ascend the ureters to the kidneys in order to cause pyelonephritis. Brachyspira, this intestinal spirochete of pigs, have periplasmic flagellae that allows for some really striking snake-like motility. In the host, this facilitates moving into and swimming through the mucus uh, in order to reach the colonic crypts. We can use the presence of some virulence factors as actually a biochemical test. So in this top image here, you can see the motility test. On the left, we have an uninoculated tube. In the middle, we have an E. coli. And on the right, we have a Klebsiella pneumoniae. And you can see that when we make a stab streak with our organism into the tube, our E. coli swims out from that central stab, giving us this very fuzzy appearance. 
The Klebsiella pneumoniae, on the other hand, really only grows along that stab because it's not a motile organism. Siderophores or iron scavenging proteins are very, very important. As I mentioned, free iron is oftentimes a limiting nutrient, even in blood. It's actually very, very tightly bound by host proteins. And so siderophores act as chelators that allow bacteria to capture uh, free iron. Um, examples include enterobactin, Yersinia bactin, pyoverdin, and pyocyanin. This is a, a plate of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and you can see this nice green color. Uh, this is the result of the pyoverdin pigment, which is a siderophore. Encapsulation is a key strategy for bacteria to avoid the innate immune response. Um, I like to think of capsules as sort of a polysaccharide force field that bacteria surround them with. Um, it prevents phagocytosis and the attachment of complement. Um, it can also protect them from bacteriophages, so stopping the bacteria from being infected themselves. On the right here, you can see this very mucoid Klebsiella pneumoniae growing on blood agar. And on the left, what we have is the same Klebsiella um, with this sort of lucent area surrounding it. I think you can appreciate that the cell is uh, encapsulated. Bacteria that produce toxins or other effector molecules have to have a way to get those effector molecules to their site of action. And so secretion systems are very, very important. These are structures which transport molecules across the cell envelope, so across the cell wall and the membrane. Um, and an, an example includes the type 3 secretion system of salmonella, which is used to inject effector molecules directly into host cells. And so it has this needle-like apparatus, which you can see in this electron micrograph on the right. Other types of secretion systems are also present, including those used for bacteria to attack each other. <laughs>